Hello and welcome to the reading of chapter 9 and 10 of the books Owls and the Family. This book is by Farley Moat. This is the chapter 9 and 10 reading, so I hope that you'll go back and watch all the videos of the chapters before this. Before we start reading chapter 9 and 10, I'd like to show you a little bit of vocabulary from those chapters. In chapter 9, you'll hear the word ructions, which is a noise that bothers others. It's a disturbance. Ructions. You'll also hear about a Model A Ford. A Model A Ford is a kind of car, and you can see that car here in this picture. It's a car that was made from 1927 to 1931. You'll hear about a fox farm. And a fox farm is a farm that raises foxes to kill them and use their fur to make things, a fox farm. And you'll hear about Cayuse, an Indian tribe that was famous for their ponies. Cayuse is an Indian tribe. And I also, let's see, I want you to think about the setting of this book. The setting of this book is in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, a place in the country of Canada. And so there you can see Saskatoon and this is the province of Saskatchewan in the country of Canada. So let's read chapters 9 and 10 of the book Owls and the Family. Wool and Weeps were with us long enough to be well known in Saskatoon, particularly Wool. As my father said, Wool never quite realized he was an owl. Most of the time he seemed to think he was people. At any rate, he liked being with people and he wanted to be with us so much that we finally had to stop trying to keep him out of the house. If we locked him out, he would come and bang his big beak against the window pane so hard that we were afraid the glass would break. Screens were no good either because he, could, he would tear them open with one sweep of his big claws. So eventually he became a house owl. He was always very well mannered in the house and he caused no trouble, except on one particular occasion. One midsummer day, we had a visit from the new minister of our church. He had just arrived in Saskatoon so he didn't know about our owls. Mother took him into the living room and he sat down on our sofa with a cup of tea balanced on his knee and began to talk to Mother and me about skipping Sunday school. Wool had been off on an expedition down on the river bank and when he got home he ambled across the lawn, jumped up to the ledge of one of the living room windows and peered in. Spotting the stranger, he gave another leap and landed heavily on the minister's shoulder. Mother had seen him coming and tried to warn the minister, but she was too late. By the time she had her mouth open, Wool was already hunched down on the man's shoulder, peering ar in around into his face, making friendly owl noises. Who, who? he asked politely. Instead of answering, the minister let out a startled yelp and sprang to his feet. The tea spilled all over the rug, and the teacup shot into the fireplace and smashed into a million pieces. It was all so sudden that Wool lost his balance, and when he lost his balance, his talons just naturally tightened up to help him steady himself. When Wool tightened his grip, the minister gave a wild Indian yell and made a dash for the door. Wool had never been treated this way before. He didn't like it. Just as the minister reached the front door, front porch, Wool spread his wings and took off. His wings were big, and they were strong, too. One of them clipped the man a bang on the side of the head making him yell even louder. But by then, Wool was airborne. 
he flew up into his favorite poplar tree and was in such a huff at the way he had been treated that he wouldn't come down again till after supper. Riding on people's shoulders was a favorite pastime with wool. Usually he was careful with his big claws that you couldn't even feel him. Sometimes he was on your shoulder and feeling specially friendly, he would nibble your ear. His beak was sharp enough to have taken the ear right off your head at a single bite, but he would just catch the bottom of your ear in his beak very gently. Nibble it a little bit, and it didn't hurt at all, though it used to make some people nervous. One of my father's friends was a man who worked for the railroad and had a very big red ears. Every time he came for a visit to our house, he wore a cap, a cap with ear flaps. He wore it even in the summertime because he sat with ears as big as his and an ear nibbling owl just to, around, he couldn't afford to take chances. Wool was usually good natured, but he could get mad. One morning, my mother sent me to the store for some groceries. My bike had a flat tire, so I had to walk, and Wool walked with me. We were only a little way from our house when we met the postman coming toward us. He had a big bundle of letters in his hand, and he was sorting them and not watching where he was going. And instead of stepping around Wool, he walked right into him. Worse still, he didn't even look down to see what it was he had stumbled over. He just gave a kind of kick to whatever it was, to get whatever it was out of his way. Well, you could do a lot of things to Wool and get away with it, but kicking him was something different. Hissing like a giant tea kettle, he spread his wings wide out and clumped the postman in the shins with them. A whack from one of his wings was like a kick of a mule. The postman dropped his handful of letters and went pelting down the street, yelling blue murder with wool right beside, right on his heels. After I got hold of wool and calmed him down, I apologized to the postman, but for a month after that, he wouldn't come into our yard at all. He used to stand at the gate and whistle until one of us came out to get the mail. Our owls were so used to going nearly everywhere with me now that when school started that fall, I had a hard time keeping them at home. I used to bicycle to school, which was about two miles away across the river. During the first week after school opened, I was late four times because of having to take the owls back home after they had followed me part way. Finally, Dad suggested that I lock them up in the big pen each morning just before I left. Wool and Weeps hadn't used that pen for a long time. Wool was particularly furious, and he began to tear at the chicken wire with his beak and claws. I sneaked off fast. I was almost late anyway. And if I knew I was late one more, once more, I'd be kept after school. I was about halfway over the river bridge when a man on the footpath gave a shout and pointed to something behind my back. At the same time, a car coming towards me jammed on its brakes and nearly skidded into the cement railings. Not knowing what was going on, I put on my brakes too, and I just had time to stop when there was a wild whoosh of air on the back of my neck, a deep hoo 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 in my ear, and wool landed on my shoulder. He was out of breath but he was so pleased with himself, I didn't have the heart to take him home. Anyway, there wasn't time, so he rode the handlebars the rest of the way to school. I skidded into the yard just, a, just as the two-minute bell was ringing and all the other kids were going through the doors. I couldn't decide what on earth to do with wool. Then I remembered that I had some twine in my pocket. I fished it out and used it to tie him by one leg to the handlebars. The first class I had that morning was French. Well, between worrying about wool and not having done my homework, I was soon in trouble with the teacher, whom we called Fifi behind her back. Fifi made me come up in front of the class so she could tell me how dumb I was. 
I was standing beside her desk, wishing the floor would open and swallow me up, when there was a whump, whump, whump at the window. I turned my head to look, and there was Wool. I hadn't, it hadn't taken him long to untie the twine. I heard later that he had banged on the windows of two or three other classrooms before he found the right one. Having found the right room, at last he didn't waste any time. Unluckily, Fifi had left one of our windows open, and Wool ducked down and saw me and flew right in. He was probably aiming to land on my shoulder, but he missed and at the last second tried to land on Fifi's desk. It was a polished hardwood desk, and he couldn't get a grip on it. His brakes just wouldn't hold. He skated straight across the desk, scattering papers and books all over the floor. Fifi saw him coming and tried to get up out of her chair, but she wasn't fast enough. Wool skidded off the end of the desk and plumped right into her lap. There were some ructions after that. I was sent to the principal's office, and Fifi went home for the rest of the day. The principal was a good fellow, though. He just read me a lecture and warned me that if I didn't keep my owl away from school in the future, he would have to get the police to do something about it. We finally figured out a way to keep the owls from following me to school. Each morning, just before I left, we would let Wool and Weeps into the kitchen. Mother would feed them the bacon rinds left over from breakfast, while I sneaked out on the front door and rode away. It worked fine, but it was a little hard on Mother because the owls got so fond of the kitchen, she usually couldn't get them out of it again. Once I heard her telling a friend that until a woman had tried to bake a cake with two horned owls looking over her shoulders, she hadn't really lived at all. Chapter 10 30 miles south of Saskatoon was a little village called Dundurn. It consisted of a garage, a couple of houses, two red wooden grain elevators between Dun and two red wooden grain elevators. Between Dundurn and Saskatchewan River was a huge expanse of virgin prairie, and right in the middle of it was a slough so big it was almost a real lake, even though the water wasn't very deep. This word slough, I've been pronouncing sloth in this book, but a friend of ours from Canada told me that it's called a slough. This lake was about the best place for ducks and geese and other water birds in the whole of Saskatchewan. The reed beds along its shores were full of yellow-headed blackbirds, bitterns, coots, and greeps. Grebes. Out on the open water, you could sometimes see two or three hundred families of ducks, mallards, pintails, shovelers, and lots of other kinds. Sometimes there were flocks of whistling swans, and in the autumn so many geese stopped to rest that they almost hid the water. Every summer we used to camp for a couple of weeks near Dundurn in a four-wheeled caravan my father had built, which we used to tow behind our little Model A Ford. The caravan was fixed up like a little ship. It had ship's bunks, ship's galley, which is what sailors call a kitchen, ship's lamps, and a ship's clock. On deck, the roof, there was even a little mast with a flag flying from it. People in Saskatoon used to call it Moat's Prairie Schooner. On a stormy night, when the wind made the caravan rock back and forth, you could lie snug in your bunk and find it hard to believe you weren't on a real schooner after all. Of course, whenever we took the caravan on a trip, Mutt and the owls had to come along. Our Ford was a convertible with a rumble seat. A rumble seat, something cars don't have anymore, was a sort of folding seat placed where the trunk is on a modern car. This is where Mutt, the owls, my friends and I used to ride. Mutt always rode with his head and front feet stuck 
stuck away out over the side of the car, while Bruce or I held on to his tail so he wouldn't fall out on his nose. The owls used to perch on the back of the rumble seat, and they had to hang on for dear life, because his eyes used to get sore from the dust of the prairie roads. Mutt had to wear goggles, the same kind that motorcycle riders wear. The sight of a goggled dog, two horned owls, and our prairie skinner used to make people in other cars take a long look at us as they went by. Sometimes they didn't believe their eyes, and then they would turn their cars around and follow us to make sure they hadn't been seeing things. During the second summer that the owls lived with us, we went to Dundurn for a camping trip. There was lots of water in the lake that year, and my father brought along his canoe, tied to the deck of the caravan. He paddled Bruce and me all around the lake, looking at birds. We must have found a hundred ducks' nests, and we even found a huge nest of sandhill crane. The first few times we went out in the canoe, Wool came down to the shore to see us off but he wouldn't come canoeing with us. I think he still remembered the trouble he'd had at, with the Saskatchewan River at the cave, and he didn't trust water anymore. All the same, he hated to be left out of things, but when Weeps made up his mind to join us in the canoe one day, Wool got up his nerve and decided he'd come too. It wasn't a very big canoe, and by the time two boys, one man, two owls, and a dog had climbed in it, it was pretty crowded and pretty low in the water. We had to sit still as mummies. For a while, Dad paddled in the open lake, and then we began to explore the reed beds. Soon, we came to Muskrat's house with the nest of a mallard duck built on top of it. We had to look into the nest and were wondering how long it would be until the eggs hatched out when a crow came sweeping over the marsh. He caught sight of our two owls and just about went crazy. He cawed and cawed until in about five minutes the sky was black with crows. The more that came, the braver they all got. And soon they were diving down within a couple feet of our heads. Dad tried to scare them away by waving his paddle and shouting, but by this time, they were so excited, they paid no attention to us. I guess no crows had ever caught a pair of owls at such a disadvantage before, and they were going to make the most of it. Weeps scuttled under my seat and hid between my legs, but Wool, who was perched on the bow of the canoe, wasn't going to run away. He kept getting madder and madder until he was hissing and clacking his beak in perfect fury. This made the crows even more excited, and some of them dived so close that the wind ruffled wool's feathers. Finally, one crow came a bit too close. Suddenly, what happened? There you can see their dad waving his oar around in the air trying to scare him. What happened when the one crow got too close? Wool had spread his wings and jumped into the air. At the same time, he gave a sort of half turn on his side and grabbed at the crow with both sets of talons. There was an explosion of black feathers and the crow went squawking off across the marsh, half naked. We didn't have time to watch him go. When Wool jumped, Bruce tried to catch him for fear he would fall into the water and be drowned. And that did it. The next second, all of us, except Wool, were in the lake. The water was only up to our knees, but the lake bottom was slimy black muck. As we scrambled to get a hold of the canoe, Bruce and I and Dad got coated from head to foot with slime. Mutt, who had more sense than any of us, 
abandoned the canoe and headed for the muskrat house. Weeps, who must have thought this was the end, somehow managed to clutch hold of Mutt's tail and was towed to the muskrat house. Wool, who had been flying when the canoe upset and who now couldn't find any place to land, kept circling over our heads, hooting at us to help him down. The crows were going wild. All the ducks and geese in the marsh were excited too. Now they started to quack and honk until there was such a row you couldn't have heard a cannon being fired. It took us nearly an hour to get back to shore. Dad pushed Bruce and me in the flooded canoe somehow, and he waded ahead, towing us. On the way, we stopped at the muskrat house and rescued Mutt and Weeps. Bull finally grew so tired he had to land somewhere, and he flopped down on my father's head. This accident made us so angry with crows, any crows, that we could cheerfully have wrung the neck of every crow in Saskatchewan. Next morning, Dad got out his shotgun and swore he was going to even up the score. He decided he would hide at the edge of the bluff near the lake. And do what? What is Dad going to do with his shotgun at the edge of the bluff near the lake? Who were they angry at? So what is Dad going to do with his shotgun? Gather and try to call them into range of his gun with a wooden crow call. Bruce and I and Wool went with him, but we stayed out of sight in the middle of the bluff while Dad tried to get the black devils, as he called them, to come close enough to be shot. But crows are wise birds in some ways. They can recognize a gun a long way off. And some of them must have spotted Dad's shotgun. He blew and blew on his crow call. But though there were lots of them around, they stayed a healthy distance away. Eventually, Wool got bored. And the first thing I knew, he had walked right out into the open and climbed up on a fence post. Well, the crow call hadn't worked, but wool sure did. As soon as they saw him, the crows forgot all about being cautious and about my father's gun. They gathered in clouds and began diving at wool. Dad couldn't miss. His shotgun was banging so steadily it began to sound as if a war had started. After each shot, the surviving crows would climb out of range. Then Wool would begin flapping his wings and hooting insults at them, and they would forget about the gun again. The war with the crows lasted until Dad was out of ammunition. By then, there were a lot fewer crows around Dundurn. When we got back to the camp, I was telling Mother about it, beginning with the way Wool had accidentally wandered out into the open. Wandered out? My father interrupted. Don't believe it. Wool knew what he was doing. And come to think of it, Dad was probably right. 